Good afternoon. This is Bob Baker with County Records Research. And today is Wednesday, August 26th, 2015. We're getting ready to start our Wednesday afternoon webinar. Um, just for clarification, this will be a recorded session. I'm going to go ahead and activate our screen view. So you should be seeing now a, uh, a white screen for the uh, for the website with uh, register now visible, and I'm just logging in. So I'm going to go ahead and hit my uh, submit, and there I'm in. Uh, now, whenever we log into the website, we're always going to see the welcome sign. Uh, welcome, uh, Bob Baker, is what we see up here on the top. Now, this is the screen we always see when we log in. And once we start, this is our home page. Now, for those of you just joining us, um, you have your counties shown above. And then on the left-hand side, we have access to various other pages on the site. And we can navigate to these various sections, such as training and support for videos and definitions, our forms page that allows us to write offers. You'll notice that uh, in our presentations, we tend to emphasize the importance of writing offers. Highly important today that we know that making offers is the key. Uh, if you don't make an offer, how does the homeowner know that you want to buy their property? And if you're going to buy the property at the auction, the phase of approaching the homeowner and making an offer is the way that we uh, we determine the value of the property and its condition. Uh, very simply, when I go to the house to make the offer, that's a chance to get up and close and personal and see the property itself. Now, this is our forms page. As you see, I, I hit forms here on the left-hand side and opened this screen. Our standard purchase offer is the real estate purchase contract and receipt for deposit. Now, this is our offer form, and you'll notice it's a very simple form. There's not a lot to it. There's only two pages. Ordinarily, in a legal size, it's one page, but you'll notice in this situation, we've set it up on two pages, standard 8.5 by 11, so you can print it out on any printer. So this is our offer form, and we specify uh, what we intend to offer, um, and, uh, and then... Um, Right here, I would put the price I want to pay for the property. If I'm coming in with a down payment or a cash offer, I would put my, my amount of cash that I'm bringing in on this section on the form. If I plan to get a new loan, then I would put that here on this section of the form. If I'm going to buy it subject to an existing loan, you'll notice that we have item 1D is buying property subject to a first trust deed. You'll also notice we have an item E for a second trust deed. Now again, I must emphasize the reason we let you know that this option is available is the lenders these days have given people a lot of time to resolve the matter of their foreclosure and they're allowing properties to go into escrow on on a uh, on a repeated basis the lenders want the property sold in a standard transaction it makes the uh, it makes the market perform uh, on its own it's, you know essentially it lets the market fix itself rather than the house going to auction. So make your offers, whether it's subject to existing loans, or whether you're going to take out a new loan, or whether you're going to bring in cash. Now, whichever way, way that you choose to go, we, we encourage you to go out there and make your offers first, even if your intent is to buy at the auction, or to buy a note. Um, whatever your method, remember that all methods are supported by our data. And what we're, our goal is essentially to set this price, what we intend to pay. And that price that we intend to pay defines what our actions are. If I can get this price by making an offer right away, then of course that's my first option, to go to the house, talk to the homeowner, get them into an escrow. And that way I can buy the property and I don't have to wait for the auction, nor do I have to have all cash unless I want to. Okay, and if we have all cash, that's great. We have plenty of options. Remember that if I have all cash and I can make an offer subject to these existing loans, 
then I'm in a position to have enough cash available to fix the house up rather than spend it all on the purchase. Okay, now I'm going to go up and close this. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to undo that. Now you notice I'm right back to my other screen. Now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, Now, how do I clear that one out? There we go. I forgot. To, I hadn't used that drawing function in a while, so I had to remind myself how to make those little yellow marks go away so it didn't look silly for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> so, now, you notice I'm right back at my forms page. I just closed out my offer form. Now, on the forms page as well, there's a sample real estate purchase offer. So that same form that I just showed you, if you click on the sample, this is one where we've actually filled one out. And in this case, he makes an offer subject to existing loans. He comes in with a deposit. And again, he's set a price right there. And for your benefit, at the bottom, we actually have the property profile from the website. So you can compare that with how the offer is filled out. That way that'll help you in terms of determining how you want to fill that out. Okay. Now, if I close this out, I'm right back at my main page. And then I can simply go ahead and choose one of my other options. Now, um, I like to use Kurt's image over here on the left-hand side as a navigation point. You'll see below Kurt's picture, you have your calendar of seminars. That's how you found um, our, uh, our presentation link today. And then below the link for today, you'll also see that we have uh, previous recorded demonstrations in case you ever want to watch a webinar on your own. Uh, we encourage you to take advantage of the videos, take advantage of the free information. The more that you immerse yourself in this information, the more you're going to get grounded in the methods to buy a property. And again, you're going to find that we don't encourage you to do anything risky or quote unquote overly creative. Um, and we're going to urge you to use conventional methods because they work. These are tried and true methods. So when Kurt tells you that you should make an offer, do so because, again, the lenders are encouraging this. Now, you'll notice these are events that we've got coming up. Kurt's going to be down in El Cajon on the 11th of September. That's San Diego County. And then on the 21st of September, he's going to be at the Civic Center Drive location in Pomona. That's Los Angeles County. The primary locations that we select for our field trips are primary busy locations where a lot of the auctions are held, and that's why we hold them at that location. The goal, of course, is to give you a chance to watch as many active auctions take place as possible, and that way you can see people actually buy properties. You'll see properties also go back to the lender because the lender always bids. If there's an auction and no one else bids, the lender always opens it up and sets the opening price. Okay. Now, um, we do have a bunch of people joining us. If it gets a little noisy, I will um, mute. So uh, if I do do that, uh, it's nothing, uh, nothing uh, to, to say uh, don't talk to me. Um, if I do end up muting you, I'll let you know. And if that's the case, then you can use the chat window here down below where I set my little message. If you use the chat window, then just remember that I'll take, I'll, I'll take a gander over there periodically during the presentation. And if you've asked me a question, I'm going to make sure I answer it for, for everybody so that we all know the answer. Because chances are, if you've got the question, other people do as well. Now, getting back to the page, you'll notice again Kurt's photograph. Now, below his photo is our, uh, is below the calendar of seminars is our seminar highlight podcast. These are audio recordings that you can listen to in your car while you're driving, or you can place on a uh, on an M, uh, MP3 or or iPod player. You'll also notice that we have our blog, and this is where we note successes from other. And, and things that we identify during the course of the, uh, the weeks. We do a lot of research ourselves here, so you notice we've got a lot of blog records. So you're always welcome to go in here and take a look at the blog and look at what information has come to our mind today because we want to share information with you as it comes to us. Now, 
below Kurt's photo, you'll see how to use the website. These are some videos. And then the Q&A with Kurt, the actual image here itself, is videos uh, where Kurt answers questions. Now, above Kurt's photo, you'll see where it says My Properties and My Searches. And I'm going to demonstrate how to use those functions here in just a moment. But we're first going to go ahead and we're going to select Property Search. Now, whenever you log in, the first thing you're going to do is pick Property Search, and then you're going to pick your target area. Now, we've got a few new uh, people in the area, so I'm going to go ahead and do some searches in an area that I haven't done very often. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to so select um, San Bernardino County. Okay, San Bernardino County is in the Inland Empire. You'll notice with any of the county zones, if you put your cursor over the county, then you'll get a list of, of cities to give you an idea of whether you're in the right place or not. Now, you'll also notice that, that I've got all the California counties visible, but there are different tabs. I've got Nevada and I've got Arizona. So every time that you want to select a certain county, make sure you're in the right state. And then make sure you check the box to the right of the county. Notice now it, it, it kind of fools you. If I click this box, it looks like I'm picking Tahama County, but it's actually San Bernardino because that's what gets highlighted in blue. The check box is to the right. Now, just below where I pick my county is a section we call Single Property Search. This will quickly become your favorite part of the website. Single Property Search accesses our archive that goes back a number of years, and it allows me to research a particular property. Um, I like to search by parcel number if possible. But if I just have an address, I can key in the street number. If it's 123 Main Street, I can type in 123, and then any property with a 123 in the address pops right up. You'll notice that they all have 123, but these are all different cities, different addresses. On the right, you see that they're pretty much uh, separated by date. The more newer records will pop up at the top. I find that when I use this function, what normally happens is that I'm going to see the record I'm specifically looking for right near the top. You'll also notice if I scroll down a certain way, we reach a point where this second column with the dates on the right hand side, all of a sudden that column is blank. So you'll notice I've got this property here in Redlands on Nanette Street. This property is a notice of default because there's no date in the second column. The second column from the right is our sale date column. If there's a sale date, it's a sale notice. Real simple, but we always have to make sure everybody knows. A sale notice will have the auction date. That's the purpose of it. It will also have an estimated bid, which is the amount owed to the homeowner. Now, a lot of people assume that this notice of sale means my opportunity to buy the property from the homeowner instead of the auction has passed me by. That Nothing could be further from the truth. Kurt has found with many of his purchases, whether he's buying the property directly or whether he's buying the note, the object is to set a price point and approach the property even the, if the auction is only days away. Because again, the lenders are keen to sell these properties through an escrow and they're happy to sell notes in certain situations as well. And the thing is, we don't know the answer to a question until we ask it. So I'm going to make an offer to the homeowner or I'm going to make an offer to buy the note or I'm going to be prepared to bid at the auction or I'm going to be prepared to buy the property after the auction from either the lender who took it back as an REO or a third-party bidder like myself. For instance, if I happen to want to buy a property and I don't have the cash and it goes to auction today, that doesn't mean I'm out of luck because the party who buys it at the auction today might buy it for a price less than I was willing to spend. If he gets lucky or she gets lucky and gets the property at a deal and I'm willing to pay more, then I'm now in a position to make an offer and get a loan versus having to have all the cash at the auction myself. So remember that our whole goal with our presentations is to teach you that buying these properties is not difficult. The only challenge is making a choice, setting a price, and then trying to achieve that price 
in every way possible. And you don't stop trying until you've either landed the property or you realize that that particular property is no longer for you and you move right on to the next opportunity. Okay? So now, I'm going to show you more about this single property search as we move ahead. But first of all, we're going to go down to our general property search and we're going to show you how we set up our searches and look for foreclosure properties. Whenever we get to this section under general property search, you'll notice that it says choose one and I've got seven choices in front of me. I have notices of default filed and this is always going to be pre-selected for you so that the first time that you go to look for properties, they're immediately available. So now, if uh, now one of our gentlemen that's uh, that's with us today has selected Arizona for where he's looking for properties, when he goes to make these selections, he's going to pick up coming trustee sales because in Arizona they only have notices of sale. It's a different program, but the methods are the same. So now, if I have notices of default here in San Bernardino County, let's see how many I get. Now, notice I'm not making any other choices yet but I can in a few minutes. But first of all, I'm going to hit search without polygon. Now that's because we're not going to use the polygon at the moment. We are going to do that in a few minutes as well. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit search without polygon. And it just gave me a search result giving me a list of properties. Now whenever you get a search result in our standard view, and this is the one that I always recommend, especially for those of you that are just getting started, un unless you want to do um, a, a series of mailers, in which case you could choose Excel. Now to show you how you do that, I'm going to point something out. I'm in a browser called Google Chrome. Um, whether you're using Firefox or Explorer or any of the other um, type uh, products, just be aware that there are tabs at the top that help us to navigate between pages. So when I have my search results open, that tab shows to be the lighter color of the two, and I've got my, uh, my list of properties. Notice how I have a tab for county records research. That's my main page, and that takes me back whenever I want to go back. You can have multiple search results open, and you can have multiple property profiles open. And what we do when we look at this information is we're looking at uh, the various properties for what we want to find. Now, uh, notice that in my search results for this search, I have 0 to 20 at the top of my map of 239 total records. Now, this will be the same whether you're searching Arizona, Nevada, uh, San Diego County, uh, Monterey County up north. Wherever you're searching, you're going to get 0 to 20 at first. Now I can go down here to the left and just below the Bing logo here on the map and it says print, send by email, show 20, 40, 60. I'm going to click on the 60. Now you notice now my map now has more of these orange push pins. Everyone represents an address below. And now above the map it says 0 to 60 of 239 total records. So this 239 total records is notices of default and 239 covers a date range. I'm going to go back to that tab up on top just to clarify whenever we make a choice in the choose one section the system will give us a date range of two weeks that will give us a result depending upon the search we choose that date range is selected for us. So in this case, notice as a default, gives me two weeks ending in today's date because we call this listed date the date that we add our properties. We, we, this is the date range that we choose for notices of default because uh, with, uh, with notices of default, there's no auction date at all. A notice of default begins the foreclosure. Now, to clarify, when you're talking about properties in foreclosure, they always start with a notice of default in, Air, in Nevada and California, and then you have a 90-day uh, a waiting period before the lender may issue their notice of sale. So a notice of default is going to have a listed date range, and again, in this case, two weeks, and then I know that I have about 90 days before the lender can issue a sale notice. Now, that's a minimum. The lenders can wait longer, and if the lender is trying to work out a deal or, get a, or help the, the, the homeowner with a payment schedule, they can give them more time.
And more importantly, if I make an offer and get it into escrow, the lender is more than happy to give us more time to try and close that deal so the property can be sold in a standard transaction and the lender can get paid. Now, I made my choice of notice as a default across my two-week range. Now, we can expand these date ranges up to 32 days. So I could cover a whole month if I wanted to search notices of default for the month of July, if I wanted to go back and do all of July, I could do that. So if I wanted to do all of July, I would simply go July 1st to July 31st, and then I've got myself a whole month worth of NODs, and I can do that search as well. Now notice that's 480 for the month of July, and I have 239 for August for this same for, uh, for now my month isn't over so there will be more that will pop up in the next few days now notice I now have two sets of search results open I could go back and forth between the two now I'm just going to focus on the more recent records these notices of defaults are the ones I want to take a look at now these are the people that just got their first notice now, I can make offers to these people. Let's say that I'm interested in a property. Um, let's look at this one here in Ukaipa. Now, before I open it, notice that we have a, an address, a city, a zip code, a lot size, square footage, bedroom and bath, a value, and then over here, we indicate which loan is foreclosing and if there's anything senior or junior to the loan. Now to emphasize what that means, the loan that's foreclosing will be indicated in the loan position. Since this is a first, it's a number one, that means that there would be uh, either a, a second, but there can't be a, a loan ahead of my first. So that's why in front of the slash is a zero. Behind the slash, it says $100,000. So that indicates that we've got a foreclosing first and a second of 100000 now, to the right, we see our auction equity figure, which is 96144 That sounds to me like we've got a property where the first that's foreclosing is right about the value of the property, or actually is about half the value of the property, because the property looks like it's worth about 187 So let's see if we've got a first that's, that's um, worth about 90 or so. Let's see. So now we're waiting for the profile to open. This is going to give me a map. I'm going to have my loan information, and I'm going to be able to take a look and see um, who the homeowner is. So notice I said I thought the loan, the first would be about 90. It's 85,600, so that was a pretty good guess on my part. Um, so now what we know is we've got a foreclosing first that was written in March of 2004 for 85.6. We've got a second that was written two years later for 100,000. Now, um, it's possible that this is a modification in second position, I don't know, or it's more likely that their house went up in value and they simply borrowed the equity out. If you're familiar with foreclosures these days, you know that's a pretty common scenario is that the homeowner bought a property and then a few years later got the phone call and decided to take out the equity and maybe fix the house up. That's what's a benefit to us as investors or uh, individual buyers of the foreclosure properties because for all we know, this couple spent money fixing the house up. Now, the property itself is on Fair Oak Trail. This is our property detail section. So Fair Oak Trail, this is the house, 36148. Now, we'll notice if we look up on top that the same address is right here where the mailing address is. So our mailing address and our property address are the same. So this is an owner-occupied property with a foreclosing first. Now, if I was going to buy this at the auction, I would be concerned to know whether or not this was a purchase first. It happens to be, and let me tell you why. Down here we've got a purchase date that says March 25th of 2004. So they bought it in March of 2004 on the 25th, and guess what? The loan was written on the same day. So this is their purchase loan. 
Now notice that our tax value is 124, 103. So it was worth about 124. They got a loan for 85.6. So they came in with a down of about 40 grand. Notice how we can kind of get a sense of what happened here. Now that's how they bought the property 11 years ago. Now two years after they bought it, almost to the day. They took out another hundred thousand dollars. Again, somebody called them up and said, "Hey, you, you're in a position to borrow more money." Now, interesting point. The first is the foreclosing loan, so that means if this goes to auction, the second disappears. Okay. Whenever we see a first foreclosing, the second will be a victim of the auction. They will get wiped out along with any liens that follow. So people often ask, you know, should I worry about liens on a property? Well, you should worry about whether the loan that's foreclosing is a first if you're going to bid at the auction. And if it's a purchase first, that's a definitive answer that the liens are going to get wiped out if it goes to auction. Now, if I want to buy it before the auction, I'm not worried about my liens because they're not my liens. They're John and Patricia's liens. This is John and Patricia Statler. Now, notice John and Patricia are the trust doors. Now, we're a deed of trust state, as is Arizona and as is uh, Nevada. In a deed of trust situation, every loan has two pieces, a note and a deed of trust. So this recording, which happened on March 25th of 04, this is the deed of trust that you can pull from the county. Okay, and here's the document identification number. It's called a TDID that I can pull from title or pull from county if I want to see what the loan itself looks like. Well, that's going to show me what they borrowed, but it's not going to give me any more detail than that because the deed of trust is an anchor. It anchors the loan to the house. Now, every loan is a note. Uh, so the note itself is how much they borrowed and their interest rate and their payment schedule and then uh, schedule fees, late fees, and other uh, um, detail related to the actual loan itself. So the deed of trust shows us who the lender is shows us how much they borrowed, and again, it has the address. It shows us the property. It also will have a signature for both parties if both parties signed the loan. So John and Patricia are the trustors. They borrowed the money. Now, there are two other parties in this loan scenario. There's the beneficiary, which is Wells Fargo Bank. So Wells Fargo Home Mortgage is the beneficiary. That's the person who lent them the money. So we have a beneficiary, and then we also have a trustor who borrowed the money, and then there's always going to be a third party in a deed of trust situation who's the trustee. Now in this case, they have not identified the trustee at this point. You're going to see the trustee get identified if a second notice comes out, that would be the notice of sale that schedules the auction. Now, in this case, the trustee is not yet identified, but that's okay. I don't need to talk to the trustee. This is a notice of default record. If I want to buy the property, I'm going to buy it from John and Patricia by making them an offer. You'll notice we always come back to that. You make an offer to John and Patricia. Now, according to our system, property appears to be worth about 187000 which is less than the total amount owed. Now, we're showing a total right here of 185.6, which is about the same number, but we also know that there's $6,000 in arrears. The loans, are, the loans themselves are uh, 11 years old, so they're not going to be paid down very far. This is probably a 30-year a, a loan. Um, and, you know, at this point, we can assume that the, the principal hasn't fallen down very much. Now, if I know it's worth about 187, in, and in the real world, that's a turnkey comp. You know what a comp is, a comparable value, is a property that's sold down the street that's going to have similar square footage and probably be a similar age. However, we don't know what this house looks like. We know they've lived there for 11 years, 
and we know that they're not making their payments. Chances are they're not making repairs either, but I could be mistaken. They could, this could be the most beautiful house on the block. However, if I'm going to go buy this as an investor, I'm going to have to sell it to make my money if I'm flipping. If I'm flipping for about 187, you know that I can't buy it for 187. I can't buy it for 185.6, or I can't buy it for 192, which is a ballpark guess of what they owe because they're probably behind on the second as well. So what I got to say is this: I got to set a price point for myself. Now I'm going to go up here to the image in the map, and what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in, and I'm going to hit my bird's eye and see what we have. So this is our home. We got some big trees in the backyard, and it looks like we've got uh, a corner home, with kind of a carport thing. It's kind of a different kind of look. Now notice that if I scroll down, I was just noticing these lots look rather small to me, but I'm used to having a bigger lot. Um, this looks like a small lot to me. It looked narrow, and, and then I let my eyes scroll down, and I'm going to show you my property details section because what I noticed here, it says the building square footage is 1,005, and the lot is 33.6, 3,360. So that's about a half lot from what I'm accustomed to. Now, some people are okay with that. Um, if I don't need a big lot, and especially in a, in a drought type situation, maybe I don't want that big a yard at all, and maybe I'm going to do something with it like pave it or put in succulents, you know. But if I don't, if I'm going to turn this into a rental or I'm going to flip it, that's incidental. My main focus is what's it worth and what am I willing to pay. So let's say that I've looked at this and I've made my assessment, and I think I can sell it for about 180. And I'm just going to ballpark that. I don't know for sure. But I, if I can sell it for 180, what am I willing to offer John and Patricia who can't pay their bills? Well, I'm going to sit here and say, well, what if I offered them 125? Now, I'm just throwing a number out on the table. doesn't mean anything because I could go to make an offer to John and Patricia of 125, and guess what they have a right to do? They could say no, or they could come back and say, well, you know, I, I'm in foreclosure, and I owe a lot more than that, and I really don't want to pay my bills, or I can't pay my bills. Now, that's another point. People in default either cannot pay or will not pay. We don't know. It's not important to what we're doing in terms of buying the property, but it's important in just knowing the psychologies that we're dealing with with folks. Sometimes there is a situation where they're embarrassed, or sometimes they're in a situation where they just simply have trouble admitting to themselves that they have a property they can't afford. So when we go to make the offer, it's important to know that I could go to John and Patricia today, and they might say, well, uh, it's nice of you to make the offer of 125, but everything's fine. We're going to take care of things. Now, just remember, we're dealing with somebody that's in a crisis, and that's okay. They can respond that way. If you get a negative response initially, don't take that badly. It's not personal. This is business on your side. And for them, they're dealing with a circumstance. So simply accept their statement and say, I'm glad you got everything okay. I am going to be in the area in a few weeks. Um, I'd like to stop by. And you could say, is that all right? Or you could say, uh, I'm going to be stopping by and see how you're doing. See how they respond. If they say, no, don't come back and talk to me, that's fine. And if that's the case, don't come back. Be, be polite. Be kind. Be polite. Be aware that they're dealing with a circumstance. Now, if they say, sure, or fine, that's what you want it. Because if they say, sure, fine, come by, that just gave, the, gave you an open door to come back. Kurt has found with his offers, not every time will they accept your offer first time around, especially if they're still getting adjusted to the idea that they just got a notice of default. Now, on that note, notice above the loan that's foreclosing, and we know this is the loan that's foreclosing because we've hit it with the red star. And we know it's a loan from 04, which is their purchase loan. And notice that above, the TDID starts with 04. There's a reason that we have all these numbers on here. The 04 um, prefix on the TDID indicates a 2004 loan. 
Okay, so now, but uh, above the loan is the as of information from this default notice because the purpose of the notice of default is to tell the homeowner that as of 7-30-2015, you're delinquent by $6,074. Now, if the amount they owed on this house was reasonable to me, if this house was worth 400000 then I could make an offer to bring that 6000 current and take over payments on these two loans. We call that making an offer subject to. Now notice when I showed you how to fill out the offer form, I specified that type of a solution because if that was the case, I could make an offer subject to and I would have to come up with 6,000 in cash and then whatever difference I needed to make the deal happen. So if I did an offer subject to and I thought they owed about two, which again is we're just ballparking about what they owe, then I could have offered them, you know, 275 if I thought the house was worth four you know that would be a fair price and I and I can't tell you that that's exactly what I'd pay them because I haven't seen the house yet but that's okay because I can offer a price and then come back and fix it later but the key is that I know the numbers I know what's going on and again in this case we know that they the lender started their foreclosure on July 30th of this year so I know for a fact the lender cannot issue the sale notice until October 30th of this year because they have to wait that necessary 90 days okay so I've got some time to say hey hey you know if they tell me that they they're not interested in my offer of 125 today I've got time to come back because I can come back in a couple weeks and maybe John and Patricia have had a chance to sit at the at the kitchen table and talk it over okay and if I happen to just leave the offer with them with my phone number on it because your phone number is right there on the form you always fill that out they might call me before I even come by and say you know we've thought about it what about you know what if we said okay well, then I would just walk them through the simple process. If they're willing to accept my offer of 125, that is a short sale. That means that I'm offering them less than the total that is owed. Now, then it becomes a question of whether or not these parties agree. Wells Fargo owns the first loan, and there's a second of 100,000. I don't know who owns that loan at this point, but there could be a chance that that second started a foreclosure before or there could be a chance that that second's already in foreclosure too now it might not affect my current strategy but if I want to know what that other lender is there's a way I can check it now we're going to take a look at our single property search option what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the APN right off this profile now, for, for those of you that are, that are new with us, the assessor's parcel number, or APN, this is, your, um, this is your fingerprint for this property, this lot. If I copy this APN, then I'm going to go back up to my navigation. I'm going to hit my county records research tab, and then I'm going to go back to this single property search section, and I'm going to plug that in and hit search. Now, it's going to load up and it's going to give me a list of any records that we've had for this particular property. If there are no other records, then I get this. Notice this is the same exact record that I just looked at. They're carbon copies. Okay, That tells me that John and Patricia have never been in trouble before with their loans. The lenders have never issued a notice of default. So that tells me that these these folks have, have done all right. They haven't they haven't had multiple notices. So something happened recently where they could not make their payments. Okay? So they met they're about six thousand in arrears on this first. And so I think I probably got a pretty good shot if I can get them to agree to a price to see if I can get the lenders to come in on a price too. Now, let's say I've offered 125 and the first is owed about, we're going to just call it, let's say the first is owed about 85 grand. I'm just going to guess that they've paid it down about 5,000 over the last 11 years and that they're 60 in arrears. I think they owe about 85. So I'm going to guess that they owe about 100 on that second because I think they've been trying. I think the two of these folks have been trying and right now they might have been, uh, somebody might have lost a job 
or they might have a relationship problem because, again, either they can't make their payment or they won't make their payment. And these folks just fell behind not long ago. I'm going to tell myself, I think they just can't. Something happened. They're either going through a divorce or they've lost a job, something, or they've lost an income. So I'm going to assume a short sale offer could close if the lenders can agree on a price. Because if I can get John and Patricia to agree to 125, then I'm into my escrow. Now, if I'm into my escrow and they owe 85 on the first and 100 on the second, so they owe 185, then I'm asking these two lenders should take a haircut of about 60k. Now, John and Patricia wouldn't get anything out of it. Let's be clear: it's a short sale. They wouldn't get anything out of it. I'm not going to offer them above what I want to pay to make them happy. And I really don't care if the lenders are happy. I care that I'm happy. So now, my options are to make my offer to them and see if that flies. My second option would be to see if I could find out who owns the second loan. Now notice, when I did my search, we didn't bring up uh, another notice. So we don't know who owns the second because they haven't foreclosed. Remember, the record we see is the foreclosing lender on the first loan, which is Wells Fargo. So I don't know who owns the second. If this was a local bank or a hard money lender, then I could go to them and I could make them an offer to buy their note. For instance, uh, I set a price point for myself of 125, right? So if they owe about 85 on the first, then I could make an offer on this second note. If I can make an offer on this second note, let's say I offer to buy it for um, 25,000 or 20,000. Let's say 20. If I can buy the second for 20 grand, then I could come up with six grand to bring the first current, and then I start my own foreclosure on the second. Then I could take this property to auction. It takes me about four or five months. On my second, that cost me 20 grand. And then I would own the property subject to an existing first of about 90. Now, bottom line is I would have had to come up with the 6,000. You know, I spent I spent 20 buying the note. My purchase price winds up falling right around 125. So notice how I set a price goal and I make an offer. And then I look to buy the second note with the same price goal in mind. Now, when we buy a note, that's complicated. We have to plan it out. That's project management. We have to know what it's going to cost us when we own the property or get paid off four or five months later. Now, if I buy that note and I take the property to, the, to that trustee sale, I want to have an idea in my mind of what it would cost me to own that property four or five months from now. We can help you with that project management. We can help you see that plan. Okay, and if you can't see the plan, if you don't have a picture in your mind of what it's going to cost you to do it that way, then we do not encourage you to buy the note. We encourage you to go to the simplest route. Make an offer. Go to John and Patricia. Make an offer. Now, notice John and Patricia are the trustors. They're also on title. So we do know that we'd make an offer to them. And once again, the mailing address is the same. We know it's their home, so we know that's where we would go to make an offer. And if they don't come to the door, don't worry about that. Throw your offer in the mailbox. For the, the bottom line is this. If we never approach John and Patricia, how do they know there's an offer? If we go there and we make the break the ice, make contact with them, oftentimes you'll find that people that are in these situations are not sure what to do. So we go to them and we bring them the opportunity to find a way out of what appears to be a confused mess. And we, as an investor, are doing them a favor. It doesn't cost them anything to, to uh, accept our short sale offer. And again, if, if they're unwilling, that's when we can look at our other opportunities like buying the note, and then finally, if those methods don't work, then we can look at following this property to auction because the loan that's foreclosing is, like I said, owed about 90 grand right now. And uh, if we wait for another few months, this will go to auction. And if it goes to auction in another few months, your price at auction is probably going to be right around 115 to 125,000.
Okay, notice how it all comes full circle. Now, um, let's say that I've liked this area and I, and I want to see if there are any other properties nearby. Well, we can use the mapping function and we can go ahead and we can select other notices of default. Notice how I just picked up another property over here on Mesa Vista, so that's another notice of default. I can select notices of trustee sale. Well, we don't seem to have a lot in this neighborhood. This seems like there's not a lot of, not a lot of turnover, but I'm going to zoom out a little bit and see now I got a lot more opportunity. Now, we want to emphasize this to you. Uh, now, this seems to be a, lot, a light area in terms of defaults, whereas over here, that seems really busy. Okay, so in terms of how we look at our information, that's part of what we're doing is we're, we're seeing what our options are. Now, if I'm a realtor and I'm looking for listings, well, look at all these. Holy smoke. Don't delay and don't hesitate to go talk to these folks regardless. Now, the orange ones are notices of default. The blue ones are REOs. That means the bank took it back. The green ones are, are notices of sale, but these red ones, these are canceled auctions. Now, some people might think a canceled auction means they've fixed their foreclosure problem. Usually not so. Usually a sale is canceled for other reasons, so don't let the fact that a notice of sale has canceled prevent you from making an offer. Now, it means it won't go to auction on that notice, but it doesn't stop me from going to the house because chances are they were able to stop the foreclosure but didn't necessarily fix the issue. Because most of the time, again, either they can't pick their payment or they won't make their payment. A lot of times it's because they can't and they might file bankruptcy for a temporary stay on the situation. But that means that someone needs to come in and present them with a permanent fix. And the permanent fix is usually taking the property into escrow and getting the lenders to discount on what's owed because the homeowners can't pay it off. Now, we've looked at a notice of default. You'll notice that it has uh, a section below where I can put my notes. I can upload photos. You'll notice up on top, I've got my save button so I can save it. And then I can select a variety of my folders to save it too, All right? So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to close these out. And notice I'm right back at my main page, okay? Now, we just did that search and we picked up those properties in the Yukaipa area. Notice if I scroll down, I'm, I've got the same area and I can go ahead and I can set up a search. Now, that was, let's see, that was Yukaipa. Where was that one? Oh, that's right, I hit my 60. Oh, that's what I did. Now, notice what I did. I had changed my listed date range, right? And now if I forgot what I was doing and I want to go back to my original search, I can always select notice of default again and it puts me back to that two-week range, and there's the house I just had. Okay, so we have a default range. Now, so this Yukaipa area, the reason that I just did that is I wanted to just kind of get back to where I was because and, and, I got kind of lost there, right? Now, okay. Now, if I want to set up a search, there's Yukaipa. It's been a long time since I was in that neck of the woods. Notice how I can now move in and find that area. And let's say that I like that area. I want to set something up in this target area, and I want to get properties around here. So let's say I've got Yukaipa there and I want to set up a search. Watch what I'm going to do. This is my polygon search. So I'm going to say, let's center on Yukaipa. I like that regional park area. I think that was real close to where we were just looking at. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to say, let's do a polygon. Notice how I just left clicked and left click again, and that creates my line. 
Then I'm going to left click again. You can do this a million times, so don't worry if it gets sloppy. And I do, I'm going to do another line, and I'm going to go this way. Oops. And now, once you get to the end where you want to finish off your polygon, you can go over here and hit Close Poly Shape. We, the reason we have that button there is when you get to that last line, it's really hard to line it up perfectly because our eyes aren't perfect. So now I've just created my poly shape. Now, I've got my search of notices of default. I've got my poly shape. And let's say that I want it to be very specific. Let's say that I'm looking for only um, three bedroom two bath and above, and I only want single family residential. Now I can pick commercial, I can pick whatever. If I'm just looking for multifamilies, uh, fourplexes and above, I can specify apartment. When you need help doing this, just give us a call. One of us can walk you through it, it's not hard. But there are also plenty of videos set up. So uh, you can look on them over the weekend and you can get this information down so you know what you're doing. So now. I've got my polygon set, I've got notices default, you'll notice right above choose one it says save this search, so I'm going to hit save this search. Now you notice the system just reset and right above where I hit save this search, or right below where I hit save the search, you'll see that it now has a little window. So this is my Ukaipa and I'm not going to spell you Kaipa out because I know I'll mess it up and it'll, I'll embarrass myself. So <laughs> I'm going to put Uke, I'm going to put Poly, NOD, and I know it's 3, 2. Okay, so that's my Ukaipa Polygon, notice as a default for 3 bedroom, 2 bath, and I'm going to hit save. Now, it just saved my search, and this is my save search page. You notice I've been busy. Now, any of these searches that's highlighted in blue is a saved search that's been activated to send me emails each day at about one o'clock when a new record pops up in my target area. So you'll notice that I now have a new one at the bottom. It's not yet highlighted because I haven't hit activate notifications. Um, so I can save as many searches as I like with polygons or without polygons, if I wanted just all of San Bernardino County and I didn't care what city, then I could have put all the same specifications but with no polygon. Now, with this search that I've just set up, if I want to get emails every day, I'll just hit activate notifications. Notice how it's now highlighted in blue. So now, starting tomorrow, every day at one o'clock, any new properties in this Ukaipa polygon that have a notice of default, I'm going to get an email if they're three bedroom, two bath, single family homes. So now my target area where I want to buy my property has just been set up for me and now my uh, virtual foreclosure assistant is going to shoot me an email every day at lunchtime that I can take a look at either during my work day or when I get home. Now, let's say that that's exciting, but I'd also like to make offers on notices of sale too. Well, watch what I do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click right on that name of that save search and notice I'm back at my search screen. San Bernardino County has been picked and if I scroll down, there's my little polygon. Okay, sloppy as it is, there it is. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, okay, here's my three bedroom, two bath. Everything is the same. I'm going to change it though and I'm going to say, let's see upcoming trustee sales. Now the difference is these are going to give me notices of trustee sale which is the properties that got a notice of default three months ago or longer and somebody hasn't gotten them out of foreclosure yet which means that you know, now again this is important not everybody knows to do what we do. Not everybody knows that you can go make an offer to these folks and they can say yes. Many people just assume that if the people haven't listed their property with a realtor that they don't have a shot. The opposite is the case because the bottom line is this, we have a shot if we try. If we go out and talk to people, you know, you get a few no's but you're going to get a yes. I always equate that with going to the dance. You're never going to get a dance if you don't ask. If you're a wallflower, 
you're not going to get your opportunity. Now, so we're going to take our opportunity. So now I've selected upcoming sales, but I haven't changed anything else. I'm going to go ahead and hit save the search again. Now you notice it just did the same thing, did my little hiccup. Now I've got another window here. So now I'm going to put yuck. <laughs> and I'm going to put um, um, poly NTS for notice of trustee sale. It's also 3-2. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and hit save, and there we go. Now, now I've got my Yuck Poly NTS 3.2, and I'm going to activate that one. So now, what I've just done is I've just created a situation where any properties that pop up in my target area, I'm going to get an email. So this becomes my tickler. This is my reminder to get out of the house and go make offers, because I'm not going to accomplish anything if I don't. Now, if I don't buy it from the homeowner, that's okay, because I can always buy the note. I can always be prepared to bid at the trustee sale auction. Now, let's say that I found these properties and I've been saving them. Well, above uh, Kurt's photo and also up on top here, we have our information for our My Properties folder. Now, if I hit My Properties either here on the left or up on top, these are the properties that I've saved by clicking on that save button up above the map. Now, um, I happen to have a bunch of folders here. Remember when I hit that down arrow, I had a bunch of folders I could drop it in. These are all my subfolders under my properties. So I could have picked any of them and dropped them in, and that would have been fine. Uh, now, if I've been using a folder and I've already uh, fulfilled that need, let's say that I've been uh, working with uh, Tom over here, and uh, I filled in, uh, I used Tom's folder, I bought him his property, he's happy, he paid me my commission or he gave me my, uh, my finder's fee, and I don't need to work with Tom's uh, properties anymore. I can just select that particular folder and hit delete, and it goes away. But let's say that I did that, and now Tom calls me back and said, you know, you did so great. My sister Sarah, she wants to buy a property. So now I'm going to add a folder for Sarah. Okay, now Sarah has a folder. Now I can start saving properties for Sarah by picking that particular folder and dropping the files in there. Okay, now in addition with my, my properties, You'll notice I can go right back to my main page. Now, you'll notice it says all folders and checked in the box. I can take these and I can drop it into an Excel report if I want to create a spreadsheet and take it to the auction if I'm saving these to go to the auction. Or if I'm putting a list together because I want to go drive around, I can do that too. Now, you'll also notice that by setting up that saved search that we did, I've set up a situation where I'm going to be getting these these properties coming up from my target area in Ukaipa, um, and I'm going to be able to start knocking on doors because I'm going to have a fresh lead list every day. So if I'm a, a, a wholesaler or if I'm an agent and I'm trying to put my lead list together, that's why you can set it up with these polygon searches. Now, you'll also notice in our My Properties folder, just like in single search, some of these have sale dates. I'm going to scroll to the right. If they have a sale date, that means it's a notice of sale record. If there's no sale date, these are NODs. So if you save NODs, they'll look like these. If you save sale notices, they'll look like these. Now notice also that um, these sales, this one's canceled, this one's postponed to September, this one's postponed, they update for us. So if we pick up an update, then they update for us automatically. Now sometimes, you'll see one that doesn't update like this one right here. And that's because we're counting on the company that's doing the foreclosure to get us that update through the services that they provide. There are a lot of websites we go to, about 30 of them. Some of them don't always update. For instance, sometimes they cancel the sale, but they don't notify us. So remember that the law doesn't require them to notify us. The law says I have to be at the auction if I want to know. Now, what we do is we go out and find it if it's there. Most of the time, your, your, your records will automatically update. If they don't, then you can always call the trustee, and we always provide a phone number right on the file. So I could open this one, 
and I could call uh, this number and key in. I th I'm pretty sure on that one I'll just key in the numbers here, and I'll be able to find out what the results are if it hasn't updated already. This one usually updates already for us, so I would check on it and find out. So now, if you're a subscriber and you're checking up on this property, first of all, if you had a bid placed on this at the auction, I guarantee you this would have been updated. Secondly, if for some reason it doesn't update because of a typo or something else, just give us a call and say, hey, this one didn't update. Can you find out what happened? We'll be happy to. Okay. Most of the time they'll be updated for you. Now, notice down below there's something different here. This is our automatic update record, our, our status change update. Now, what we did have, oh, okay, I see what happened here. So here's what's going to happen with this one. And this is a good learning tool. This property was set to go to sale in August of 2014. The current sale date we show was August 21st, but notice there's a year in between these dates. And, and what happened here is the lender had to postpone because if they were going to take it past August 25th, then this notice of sale will expire. Notices of trustee sale are good for one year and one year only. If the initial sale date is surpassed because they filed bankruptcy and bought themselves more time, then the lender will have to publish a new notice. So I'm going to make a, a guesstimate right here. This sale was canceled, and we're going to see a new, new notice of sale come up. That new notice of sale will come up in the next couple weeks, and I want to see it because I've just decided I want to see it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say email me when the status changes. And I'm going to put my email address in here. All right. So now I've just put in my email address and requested my notification. Now, that's also part of my My Properties program for email notifications. And now I've just set it up where I'm going to get notified. Now, notice I've set up a bunch of email notifications on properties. And I'm going to get notified. I'm going to get an email when that property gets updated. Now notice that the, these in here, postponed, canceled, postponed, canceled, postponed, canceled, and there's the one that I just saved. That's the odd man out. That's the odd man out. Everyone else has been updated. Okay, so now what's going to happen is when they issue a new sale notice on this property in Arcadia, it's going to have the same information, the same parcel number, the same address, the same home, everything's the same. In fact, if it's the same foreclosure, they're going to have exactly the same trustee sale reference number, and that's what our system's going to recognize because it's going to look like a carbon copy of the other record. Perfect. So now I'm going to get notified when that new notice of sale comes out, and I'm going to be aware of it, just like I'm getting my other emails that are telling me about these other things. Now, when I go to um, check my email, then I get my emails, and they look like this. Okay? And then I can click on them and go to my record. So we constantly get emails all the time on these different properties if we set them up to keep ourselves motivated. Because the bottom line is this, the difference between acquiring our foreclosure properties and not is that we take the time to research on the website, we take the time to watch the videos, we take the time to attend field trips if, if we're in the position to do so. If we can't attend the field trips because we're, we're tied up doing other things, then take the time to call and ask questions. If you can't make the time to call and ask questions, that's okay. You can email us questions. You can email me a property address and say, Bob, I'm not sure what to do about this particular property. What would you do? And I can look at it, and I can come back to you, and I can and I can give you my two cents. If you want me to email it to you, I'll email it to you. If you would rather me uh, call you back, I'll call you back. Now we are busy. We have a lot of calls coming in. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are starting to realize that. Um, taking their money out of the stock market and buying a foreclosure ain't a bad idea these days. <laughs> so be aware that we're going to get back to you and we're going to answer all your questions for you. It might not be the same uh, hour that you call us, 
but you're going to find that we are active and proactive in getting back to you and answering your questions for you because we want you to succeed. You know, we grow by referral. Most of our clients come to us because somebody else found success by taking the time to learn and research and figure out the simple methods that Kurt has discovered over 35 years of active foreclosure investing. We are going to be your sounding board, we are going to be your mentor, and I'm here to motivate you to keep active and make offers and keep researching properties. Now, make sure that you're aware that it's a simple game. Pick the property you like, set a price, and then go out there and knock through Kurt's five ways to buy a property. And again, we make an offer to the homeowner, or we look to see if we can buy the note from one of the lenders, or we look to see if we can buy it at the auction, or if we don't buy it at the auction, we look to see if we can buy it from someone else who did. And bottom line is this, once I've gone through all my methods, if that doesn't work, then I A, move on to other properties because there's always more, every day there's always more, and B, one foreclosure isn't isn't the, the limit on a property. And I gotta tell you, you're gonna discover this as you do research, some of these homes have been foreclosed on more than once. So you might miss the chance this year, but that same property might be right back in our system two years from now, and then you get five more shots at it. Okay, this has been Bob at County Records Research, and it's Wednesday, August 26, 2015. Thank you for attending our webinar. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you today. Please uh, feel free to call and ask questions, email questions, and remember, if we get out there and work the system, the system works for us. Thanks a lot.